Welcome to the Heart Centered Sales Leader Podcast on webtalkradio.net. Of course, I am your Heart Centered Sales Leader and host, Connie Whitman. So thank you for joining us this week. Now, every, um, every week as you tune in, I do hope that my guests and I provide just a really um, a good platform or strategies and ideas for you to navigate um, and to help you on that road to navigation I have a free uh, communication style assessment that I provide you just go to my website whitmanassos.com slash CSA communication style assessment that's short for that you get a report two reports actually one showing your superpowers one showing your blind spots and both to help you navigate all of your communication with your clients now today for my motivational quote is by Eleanor Roosevelt and Eleanor says no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. So are you one of the millions of people worldwide who secretly worry that you might, uh, you might not be who, who everybody thinks you are or come across that you feel you're not capable of what people are expecting from, from you? You've probably heard it called the imposter syndrome and many of us suffer from this. When these feelings of inadequacy boil up, and, and you know what guys, it does for all of us. What do you do? How do you show up and quiet that negative record player that seems to grow louder, right, as the responsibility of whatever we're doing grows. Well, of course, today I have two amazing guests for you, not one, but two. I have Dr. Valerie Young. Now, uh, Dr. Valerie is an internationally recognized imposter syndrome expert, author, and keynote. Carolyn Herforth, I don't know if I said that right. Carolyn is a leading business growth strategist with a global clientele. Together, the two of the dynamic duo I have here today are the co-founders of Imposter Syndrome Institute, the world's number one source of imposter syndrome syndrome solutions and our licensing arm for the global network of speakers, trainers, and leaders, excuse me, who are meeting the growing demand of imposter syndrome solutions. So please help me welcome my amazing guests, Caroline and Valerie to the show. Ladies, thank you for being on. Thank you. I'm thrilled. Yeah, this is, this is an important, important topic. Um, First one, can, can you just define what imposter syndrome is and that kind of will ground us for the conversation today? Sure. Actually, the the more accurate term is the imposter phenomenon, and it was uh, coined by two psychologists in 1978, Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes. And what they found is that despite evidence of our abilities or accomplishments, a lot of bright, capable, competent people feel like they're somehow fooling other people into thinking they're more intelligent and talented and capable than they really are. And how they do that, Connie, is they kind of dismiss or downplay their accomplishments. They're like, well, yeah, I was just lucky. It was a fluke. Well, that's just because they like me. Uh, I had connections. That's the only reason I got the, you know, I got that land at the, the sale or uh, got my foot in the door, whatever it might be. And so there's this, they're left with this kind of fear that they're going to be one day be found out but but just back to that term everybody calls it imposter syndrome now but i always want folks to know it's not really a psychologically diagnosable mental illness or syndrome of any sort but that's how it's popularly referred to it to men and women valerie both suffer from this equally like what do the statistics show yeah that's a great question you know when it was first coined the term that the, the thinking was it was something that primarily impacted women and I think women as a group are more susceptible for a host of reasons and I think it holds us back more mm. that said there is that kind of myth of the ever confident male and there are a lot of men who feel like imposters uh, and in some environments you know it's roughly equal so uh, it's definitely not just a female issue. Yeah, I think most, I think, I think women, uh, I think it's associated with women because we're more verbal about things like, oh, they're going to find me out where men, I think, played a little closer to the vest typically, typically. Mm-hmm. Va- I think, Valerie, this is a question for you as well. What are the downsides of imposter and the imposter phenomenon? I'm really glad you asked that. It's funny because I'm working on an article about all the folks out there who say it's their superpower and it's really a good thing because it makes you work harder. It's like, yeah, kill yourself. Great thing. right? try to outrun the no talent police. Um, I think the downsides far out uh, outweigh the, the good, the supposed good, you know, because, yes, you do over prepare and you do, you know, work hard, but often at a real cost. 
you know, to other parts of your life. And if you're working hard to outrun the no talent police and to avoid being found out, that's a stressful way to work hard. I'd like to think I could be motivated to work hard for other reasons other than that. And I think what we forget, we often associate imposter syndrome with high achievers, but in reality, it also keeps a lot of people from achieving more than they really could if it weren't for these nagging feelings of self-doubt. So they don't speak up, they don't raise their hand, they don't go for more challenging opportunities, bigger sales, they don't scale their business because they, they feel like if I poke my head up, I'm going to be found out. Yeah, so the downside is we actually hold our we shoot ourselves in the foot, hold ourselves back, and we, we play smaller than perhaps we should be playing, right? That's the idea. It, it's funny, I have, um, you know, my, my gynecologist, right? You go annually and we chat. And so a couple of years ago, I was asked to speak pre-COVID at a really big event. So of course, you get nervous because there was going to be a lot of people and, and it was very high profile. And so I was telling her and she's like, oh, you'll be great. So of course, I started with, yeah, but what, like, what if, right? That whole negative record player, we all have it. And she, is one of the leading I'm in I live in New Jersey she's one of the leading she is the leading OBGYN here in New Jersey and all of the doctors go to her for advice and she had to speak at, at a, a panel or something in Manhattan and she said to me as I was driving she says I almost wanted to pull over and throw up and I'm, and I'm thinking you're brilliant what's wrong with you she says it's that whole imposter that they're going to find us out it's that negative record player we all have it. Do you find that to be the case? Even with, she's very influential, right? She's the go-to person, yet she has these underlying thoughts as well. Absolutely. I mean, very often, the more accomplished you are, you just feel like you're fooling more people on a higher level. <sighs> you know, that, that that's all that's going on. So, yeah, and you know, there's farther to fall. You know, the more successful you are, the more degrees you have, the more prestigious, you know, and accomplishments, then, you know, you just, I mean, Tom Hanks, right? Maya Angelou, all of these people have talked about imposter, imposter feeling. So really common, even at very high levels. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And, and in Valerie's, and in Valerie's book, the, the Secret Thoughts of Successful Women, she tells a load of stories about people who, Meryl Streep and some of these very high profile, very accomplished people and how they struggle with it. So the book gives a lot of anecdotes. You, you do feel like you are not the only one. Um, yeah. when you get through Valerie's book. Yeah, yeah, I, and that there's value in that. Like, really? Right? <laughs> These very prestigious people are feeling the same way as I am. It's not such an abnormal, emotional place to be, right? So that's kind yeah. of the good news, bad news, right? Are you guys seeing key trends um, you've observed around this specific topic? Because you're, like, you're, the, you're the pioneers, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, would, do you think, go, go ahead, what were you going to say? <clears throat> Well, I was just going to say, this is actually one of the things that I found so fascinating as, as Valerie and I have come together to co-found Imposter Syndrome Institute, because um, Valerie has been in this world and working and studying and, and speaking about imposter phenomena and imposter syndrome for almost 40 years. Wow. So I step into this as a, to help develop um, an organization so that we can work with more people to stamp out imposter syndrome. So we're doing research and 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 really sharing what the opportunities are. And the trends are so fascinating because, you know, as Valerie talks about, this this all kind of started where women were the ones who, you know, we thought it was, people thought it was limited to women. And um, that's not necessarily the case. I think Valerie has said that she'll have, you know, half her audience will be men. And if it's not just a female only uh, event, but a, a lot of people, the other thing is um, she's talked a lot and Valerie, I think you can speak to this, but you know, this is a larger diversity and inclusion issue. Yeah, definitely. It goes very often. I'm contacted by large corporations, universities, and often the first entry, the first contact is by some women's initiative. And I always encourage them to kind of widen that lens because, yeah. you know, two things. One, a sense of belonging fosters confidence. So when you walk into a workplace or a meeting or a conference, the more people who look like you, the more confident you feel or sound like you, right? Maybe you've got a strong regional or working class accent or English is not your first language. Uh, and also, whenever you're on the receiving end of stereotypes about competence or intelligence, you're going to be more susceptible to imposter syndrome. So that could be based on race. 
that could be based on age, right? We all know what it's like to feel underestimated because we're the youngest or maybe on the other end of that continuum, right? When I, when I was speaking at Facebook, I said, how many of you have ever been the oldest and felt underestimated? And the 30 year olds raised their hand at Facebook, right? Wow. So it's all it's kind, of, kind of relative. If you're first generation in your family to go to college or have this you know, prestigious job or a white collar job, you're more vulnerable as well. So it, it is a broader diversity and inclusion issue. I mean, I'm, it's not surprising to me that Michelle Obama talked about her own imposter syndrome. Because when you are the first or one of the few or the only, there's, there's that added pressure now to represent your entire group. Yeah, which is it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of responsibility. You know, here's the thing, though. Kudos to them for even stepping into that role, that, that's courageous because they don't have to, right? So um, I find that courageous when people do that. Now, you've one more question for you, um, Valerie. You've been doing this for 40 years. So I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. That's a long time, right? So, you know, four decades. Have you seen changes in, in that 40 years, right, each decade, as hopefully we evolve as humans. <laughs> I don't know, maybe not. But have you seen differences? Or is it kind of, wow, in 40 years, we're seeing the same thing? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think fundamentally, we're seeing the same thing. I think a few differences that early on, you know, because I'm also a speaker and do workshops, it was primarily universities and associations bringing me in. Mm. Much more, I mean, but more recently, the huge focus is on corporations, because there's an understanding. I mean, interestingly, I wrote a cover article to Executive Female Magazine in 1986 talking about the organizational costs, that this is not just an individual phenomenon, that there's consequences for employees and so on, but also for the, the organization. So I think there's an increasing recognition of that. Um, I think and then a, a very situational way, people who work alone are also more susceptible to imposter syndrome. So the fact that so many b more people have been working remotely yes. is also exacerbating it. And it's I mean, think about it. You start a new job and you've never met your coworkers, right? They only are con dealing with you over these virtual kinds of platforms, which can be, you know, very kind of stressful as well. And I think the third one is when I started out, so this would be like in the 80s, right? Women were looking to get into middle management and advance in organizations. And, and that's still, you know, a push. But I also think that women as a group have a more layered definition of success to include money. Uh, and there's, you know, there's, there's money and status and all that, but it's also about meaning and balance and, and satisfaction. So, which I think therefore makes it hard to tell sometimes, am I afraid to go for this big promotion? Because uh, I don't think I can do it, or do I not want it? Do I not want to take this job where I'm going to be, have to be on a plane every week and work 80 hours a week? So I think that that's part of the consideration, but also makes it more complicated to kind of parse out why I'm reluctant. It's fascinating. It's 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 a lifelong right endeavor. You've been doing this 40 years, and it's still here. It, 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 have you found that it's it's been again more? The corporations now are calling you in. It's not just academia per se. Um, I'm giggling that you wrote the article that's still very relevant today in 1986. Right? It's still very relevant today. Do you find that the internet has kind of uh, catapult this conversation so that organizations are that the the the, the perspective we kind of went out here now, um, just academia and organizations. Now we're kind of across the board. Do you think the internet has enhanced that? I think that's part of it. But I mean, I've owned the domain imposter syndrome dot com since uh, 1995. So, I mean, it's been on, out on the internet, but it is it is the hot topic right now. Everybody's yeah. writing about it accurately and not, you know, in, in, in some or not. cases. But I do think <laughs> to your point, I think, Connie, is social media has also played a role because we can't all be living our best life and yet you know you just see people's highlight reel and so if you're constantly comparing yourself to other people like mm. how your business is doing or how you're doing in your career or your art or whatever it is you're going to feel less than yeah compare phobia it's dangerous real dangerous right yeah, yeah. what the other thing I, I one thing i want to add to that too is imposter syndrome is a global issue so yes, i yes. was having a conversation with um uh, a, a guy who's originally from I Italy, so he's first generation. He came to the U.S. to go to Stanford for his 
um, PhD and he works for the Federal Reserve. And we talked about like how all of those things created imposter feelings in him. And so we were talking about, you know, the diversity and inclusion elements of that, the fact that this is not just Americans, it's not just a made in America issue. Sure. But also, you know, Valerie, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about this, and I've alluded to it, but, you know, uh, the Imposter Syndrome Institute is the licensing arm so that we can expand Valerie's work and have more people sharing her proven and practical solutions to this. And as we've been opening up the institute for applications from people who are interested we're getting interest from all over the world i mean slovakia slovenia <sighs> netherlands poland spain nepal austria italy like hong kong it's everywhere south africa so chile we, you know it's really uh, yeah yeah yes it is so i think that's just another thing is that you know as americans we are kind of viewed as maybe I don't know if self-absorbed is the word, but this is something that when people find out what it is, they're like, oh, that's what's going on. And it's not just happening in the U.S. Hey, yeah. Humans are humans, right? right, we're, all, right. we're all wired the same. We all bleed the same. So why wouldn't we have the same kind of... Um, that, that negative record player that thought I'm not good enough or I'm going to be found out, right? Humans are humans. I think we keep labeling things, right? Like my, my dad was born in Italy, right? I'm first generation American. I'm a first generation American. Like we label things, but yeah, that we label, but, but at the end of the day, we're all human, right? It just, it is what it is. So yeah, this is, this is a fascinating topic and fascinating that it is a global um, phenomenon as well. So you spoke about the imposter syndrome Institute. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing there? So there's help, right? There, the, at the end of the day, this is the bottom line, peeps listening. There is help for this. It's not just let's keep talking about the syndrome or this, this phenomenon, but let's talk about what are the solutions. So what are you guys really, really doing to make a difference? So I would like to answer this question. And the reason I want to answer this question is because Valerie has, she is the world's foremost expert on this topic. She's only one person, you know, she's been, she's written a book and it still shows up on the top 100 books in women in business. Wonderful. I mean, after 10 years now that shows some real longevity. And so there's that she's out speaking uh, nice that she can do it from home now, but you know, she's, she's only one person. And, yeah. uh, so we've known each other for quite some time and we started talking several like, a while back just saying you know maybe it's time to create uh, an institute so that other people can be using because she she can only do so much absolutely so how can she create a legacy have other people out there sharing the the proven programs incorporating into their coaching businesses their keynotes their workshops if they're you're a you know trainer a facilitator so really thinking about or your organization train the trainer so we co-founded imposter syndrome institute so that we could train people on her program to just really expand the work and help more people in the world and so our plan for rolling out is we are taking applications from individuals who are interested in going out and working with their own clients or new clients and helping them share this, this, um, these solutions and tools and insights with their clients and with potential clients. So we're starting with those individuals, then we'll get to enterprises and organizations and higher education, train the trainers. This is needed. You know, there's so many coaches out there. And as we have more business owners opening up every day, that coaches are definitely needed. I mean, I have a coach and I'm a coach, right? So we, we, you have to, you have to, you, you don't know what you don't know. We all have blind spots. So I love mm -hmm. that you're, because as a coach, right, how important is that to get into the mindset there's a lot of talk about mindset now this right. is a real tangible we've all and here's the here's the cool thing we've all felt it you felt it i felt it right valerie you felt it we've all been there everybody understands this conversation today so this is such a needed resource funny that it takes 
a lifetime, right, Valley? And I'll say for you, 40 years to be able to come and create this institute now. The other cool thing, we're talking about Facebook and social media and stuff, but now we have an opportunity to really affect the entire global world because we don't have to do it in an office building in Manhattan, right? We can we can do it via Zoom. So, wow, what a great time to be alive and what a great time to be creating this type of resource and platform. Just kudos, lady. I'm it, just blowing me away. Yeah, You wanted well, to say I, something, to, Val? To your point, Connie, th- th- what that means is that you, you can be a speaker or workshop leader or coach in indiana or in india and be, but be, de, be, be delivering something for people anywhere in the world i mean in a couple of weeks i'm going to be doing a thing for 2000 uh, executives and professionals in south africa i mean it would take me at least a week of travel and yes. you know, re- recovering from the time change and yes. all that if i flew out there to do it yes well, i can I- do that in the morning and just be speaking to you know microsoft in the afternoon I, it's fascinating what this has done for us. You know, co- listen, COVID was horrible, deaths, all of those things. We cannot forget that. But on the flip side, what were some of the huge benefits that we've gained from it? And as business owners, we really don't want to lose sight of that because our message, we could play bigger. We Now we really could play bigger. Now we really need you ladies to help us with the syndrome, right? With the, the imposter phenomenon. Why, going back now to organizations, I understand you're starting with the, the individual right and to to teach them to incorporate this into their coaching and whatever their world is why wouldn't an individual or an organization maybe create their own program imposter uh phenomenon or imposter syndrome program well and they they certainly can um you know google did that i did a i did a, a live program with google a couple of years ago before COVID hit and people it was a huge response i mean i'm a standing ovation from a hundred young people, Aww. which you don't get a lot, right? Mm. Um, but they ended up, just based on my book, putting something together in the company. And nice. I've been in contact with them. I kind of looked at it. They got some things right, and they got some things like, eh. And they also realized that, you know, they're getting emails from people that are kind of looking for therapy, basically. Really? And so it's one of these topics where, you know, you can learn how to do it, but it's also could be dangerous in the hands of people who don't know exactly what they're talking about. You know, I, I'm not a psychologist, which I think is really good because I think this topic has been over psychologized mm. and that we need to do more contextualizing to understand what are the perfectly good reasons why someone might feel like a fraud. So do more contextualizing and less personalizing. And a lot of coaches are out there suddenly being experts and specialists based on reading an article, frankly. Uh, and then they're trying to help people like find their hidden wound. Like, what is that thing that happened when you were five years old that made you feel like an imposter? Well, maybe it's as simple as, you know, you became the first lady and you're the first black woman to, to do that, right? I don't think you have to have a childhood wound, you know, or suddenly, you know, you go up working class and now you're off going off to Harvard and you don't can't relate to other folks and you feel less than. I mean, there's, or you're in a creative field. People in creative fields, writers, actors, uh, musicians, you know, they're being judged by subjective standards by people whose job title is professional critic. People in STEM fields are more vulnerable. So if you don't understand the bigger picture and get that view from 20,000 feet, I think you can do more harm than good, frankly. Yeah, and I'm giggling as you said they wrote an article and now they're an expert. I run into this all the time. Someone is successful in their business or whatever it is in their role in sales, right? Because I'm a sales expert. 39 years, Valerie, so we're peers, right? right? So 39, and I hear some of the, and all they, it's the, they walk the walk, right? Or they they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They're saying the right things, but I'm thinking, but that's not what you're showing. Build relationships, but you're not telling anyone what to that really mean right yes it's about building relationship how so that 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 uh you know the the um uh glacier not the glacier the tip of the iceberg right they know 10 yeah. percent, and really the magic is underwater that you can't see and that's the 90 percent. you ladies are the freaking 90 percent that really is needed in the world right so how does someone know if th- because this sounds like this sounds like like a lot of education, a lot of self-discovery, right? A lot of work. Self-discovery is always a ton of work. How does someone know if they're cut out to join your institute and, you know, the network of trainers? And how do they know if they're a good fit even to contemplate that? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is if they're, they 
really want to make a difference. It's like, this isn't just a one-off, you know, I want to add one more certification to, right. you know, the hundreds I've already got. It's like, they really want to make a difference and they're already doing it through work that they're doing themselves um, with their clients or with their audiences or with their workshop um, people. Um, so, Valerie, go ahead and well, I think, I think that, you know, it's different for different people. You know, if, if one person wants to stand up in front of a thousand people at a major conference and deliver, you know, a, a strong presentation, you know, keynote to a major company, you, you need strong platform skills. You need to be a good speaker. But then there's people who like, no, they, they're much more comfortable doing a, a workshop with 12 people or 15 people. That's sure. much more small and intimate. And that calls for basic facilitation skills. But you need the content, too. You need to have something to present. Cause it's not all this big self-discovery thing. It's more about understanding that, for example, like people who don't feel like imposters, they're no more intelligent, capable, competent than the rest of us. It's just in the exact same situation where we might feel like an imposter. They're thinking different thoughts. Uh, they're, and I don't mean that they're just saying, you've got this and you can do it and you deserve to be here, all of which are true but they're thinking differently about competence and what it means to be competent. They have a different response to failure mistakes and setbacks and constructive criticism and to fear. So your your physician, uh, that top New Jersey physician who's anxious about going to make the presentations. So it could be a fear of public speaking, which I want folks to normalize fear because we think if I was really competent, I'd be confident. Don't confuse competence and confidence. The most competent people on the planet have can have tremendous anxiety about getting up on a big stage. So it doesn't mean you're not competent. But she could also have this mindset of, I need to know 150%. Or what if somebody asks me a question I don't know the answer to? Yes. And somebody said to me, what if you do a presentation and there's somebody in the audience who knows more about imposter syndrome than you do? And I said, great. I'll learn something from them, right? But if you think you have to know everything, you're going to feel like an imposter. Yeah, it's impossible yeah. to know everything about everything. You're the, you're the, you're like you're the grand poobah of this, of this topic. Or the godmother. The godmother, I love it. Yes, uh, I'm Fred Flintstone. Grandmother, that's all right. that's yeah. yes. I no, you are truly the pioneer, right? You are the, you're you are at the top of the pyramid, so to speak, right? So the queen, and. I'm sure you have imposter, you, you feel that imposter syndrome creep up uh, every once in a while, I would think, even being an expert. Maybe I'm wrong. Can we be like you? More, at this <laughs> point, it's more that I feel like what I'm giving people is the information, insight, and tools so that when any of us have a normal imposter moment, we can yeah. talk ourselves down faster. So yeah, if Oprah called me tomorrow, I would be like, I don't know what I'm talking about. Or, and then I go like, what do I wear? You know? But 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 I also know how to talk myself down and how to, you know, practice like hell and go get support and, you know, and, and know walking in, I'm going to be really anxious and that's okay. I'm going to try to frame it as excitement instead of fear. It's really funny uh, story. I had a, a guest on that I have been following for a decade. So she's like a celebrity. And I somebody introduced us and I sent her an email and she's like, sure, I'd love to be on your show. So immediately my heart went down and I thought she's going to think I'm an idiot, right? F first thought. So she comes on and it was, it was Zoom. Thank goodness that I could see her. And I said, just, you have to give me a minute. And she looked and she said, why? I said, I've been following you for 10 years. You're a celebrity to me. I just have to get my faculties. Otherwise, what, what's going to come out of my mouth is hamada, 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 right? So she burst out laughing. She thought that was the funniest thing. We giggled. And I was fine after that. She was yeah. real, right? The person that I had made her out to be, she was very real and approachable and all those. That's why I followed her because I felt she was truly authentic. What I saw in front of me was exactly what I had been following. I immediately felt comfortable. But I have to tell you, I did tell her, you got to give me a second. I got to slow my breathing down. I was going to hyperventilate. <laughs> <laughs> it's great that you put that out there. You know, I was speaking in front of like a couple of hundred healthcare executives in Orlando and I started coughing, you know, and you have like a dry cough. Mm -hmm. I had to step off the stage, take a drink of water. I came back. I said, how many of you would be mortified right now if that happened to you? And people raised their hand. I said, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> it's not that I don't care. It's that now I have it in perspective. Now I know like nobody stormed out of the room. Nobody said a horrible presentation. She coughed. It's like we have to 
shake things off more quickly and be able to laugh and, and just rebound faster. Yeah, most people were thinking, oh, that happened to me. I hope she's okay. That probably was 95% of the room, right, being empathetic, not judgmental. Yet we go to, I'm going to be judged. It's Humans are interesting, right? We're very interesting, ladies. Yeah. So my last question, um, we are out of time, but I, people, I hope, are like, holy moly, how do I get more of these ladies? I need more information. So the website is imposter uh, imposter syndrome dot com. Did I get that right, ladies? Yep. And if yep. they have an email, Carolyn, they should email you. So it's Carolyn at imposter syndrome dot com. Is that yep. kind of That'd the be great? Okay. That um, any any last minute tips, ideas, strategies? Um, to let people know if they, number one, they are a good fit for what you're trying to build and teach or just kind of put their mind at ease, like you're not alone. Is there a tip or strategy? Like Valerie, you said, you know how to talk yourself off that ledge quicker, right? Yeah, I mean, for the folks who might be interested, there's tons of support. Again, this is not a one-off. Here, here's your here's your facilitator manual. Good luck. You know, Carolyn and I are going to be meeting with people monthly and helping them understand, like, what if you have folks who are physicians in the audience? You can't mm -hmm. stand up and say, don't be a perfectionist. Well, thank you. I want my I want my doctor and my pilot to be a perfectionist. So you have to know your audience, and we're going to be there to help them with those kinds of things, how do you answer questions, but also how do you market? How do you get clients? How do you, you know, build your experience around this topic so that you can make money by making a difference. Yeah. And and we do. We want to play bigger. The bigger we play, the more we can do, the Absolutely. better we can serve, right? Yes, we all need to make money and make a living and that's okay, right? It's just an exchange of energy. But on the flip side, it's how do you want to show up? Right? What is your legacy? Your legacy isn't the dollars in the bank. Your legacy is what are people going to remember you by? I really believe that, right? Yeah. And I believe that the work that Valerie is doing in this uh, this organization will allow more people to have both, leave a legacy and earn a, a living, more than a living, um, being able to do this kind of work. So that makes me really excited about the whole organization and, and the work that we're doing together. This so, And the one thing I wanna say, you said what advice or what final thing, I wanna say to anyone who's inter who, who is interested, but they're like, I don't know, you know, I'm, like I'm a coach and this sounds interesting, but I would say if your imposter cell, uh, imposter syndrome bell is ringing, reach out, look at, check Explore. it out anyway, because yeah. why wouldn't you? Sure. And Valerie and I are very much of the mindset that we want the right people helping build this organization. So nobody is going to slip through the cracks if, if, if it doesn't, if it's not a good mutual yeah, and I just want to comment on that. It's foolish that if, if your gut is saying, I think you need to look into this. I think you need to look into this. Look into it. it it's not like you're committed and you, you've got to give your firstborn. You, you know, it's just freaking look into it. And is it the right thing? Is it not? You'll know. And I think more importantly, um, ladies and Caroline, you and I hit it off the first time we spoke. You'll know you'll know my my two friends here will know if you're the right fit or you might not be ready for them yet which is okay too but then maybe they could give you some advice work on these things next year come and look at us or two years from now we're in exactly. this together right it's got to be a win-win yeah. scenario yeah. otherwise we're, we shouldn't be doing it right so i love that yeah. thank you for sharing that yes if you're curious have a conversation. It's a conversation. You're, you're, again, you're not giving away your fruit. You're not marrying these ladies. Uh, so yeah, check it out. Thank you so much. This is such an important Thank topic. You, oh, I loved having both of you. It's in, I love I love the dynamic of three. It's uh, interesting because you do, you each come from a different perspective as well. So that kind of makes it a, a as a host. It makes it really fun to have that conversation. So thank you for your brilliance. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, the world needs it, right? I think we all need it. And I just want to comment. I have a lot of uh, corporate folks, executives that follow just because my background is corporate and my clients clients up until COVID were really purely corporate. Now I'm shifting to, to business owners as well. So you have a little bit of mix here. So it'll be interesting um, who ends up reaching out to you. But I, I think the message is important. And I think the corporate clients are out there 
looking for resources because they just don't know what to do because they're not experts in it. So I, I love that we had this show. Thank you for just the wealth of information and clarification. Valerie, I love how you clarified also that um, it, the psychology behind it, um, you know, humans are humans. We're all facing it. So it's not like a one event that happened when we were kids. So thank you for that clarification as well. Yeah. Love you, ladies. Thank you for being on. Thank you all, um, my, my peeps out there. Um, thank you for joining me weekly as we question, build, and discover together that no matter what the topic or what the situation, I have wonderful experts that are willing to come on and share their expertise and love with you um, to help you become your better self so you can play larger out there in the world. Um, thank you for tuning in to the Heart Centered Sales Leader Podcast with me, your Heart Centered Sales Leader and host, Connie Whitman. And I truly wish everyone just a wonderful week filled with inspiration Take a moment, pause, think about, does this resonate with you? It can be a really, really uh, beautiful catapult for your business and yourself to show up bigger, play bigger, and do more to make this world a better place. So thank you, ladies. Thank you all for joining me. And I'll see you guys next week. Big kisses, everybody. Thanks so much.